Well, hi, and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. Here being Saddleworth, England, uh, where we're continuing on in our study of Paul's letter to the Romans. This is now our 24th session in this study, and I'll remind you once again that all of the studies are available here online and continue to be so that they're available on demand if you want to see them again or invite others to participate and see it. And do invite others and, to participate. Yes, do invite others. This is, this is a real blessing. Yeah. And um, I, I want to encourage you to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com yeah. um, with any su suggestions, any comments, any questions that you might have. And we'd just love to hear from you. Just drop us a line and say hello and let us know where you're watching from. Amen. Right? Um, as I mentioned, it's the 24th time in the letter uh, to the Romans. And we just, last week, finished up at our look at Romans chapter 8. So we're going to be starting at Romans 9, 1. So if you grab your Bibles and your pencils, paper, whatever you're going to use to take notes, and it's always a good idea to take notes, or at least be prepared to take notes. And I'll remind you again, don't take my word for anything. Test it against God's word. All right? Check out what I say. Uh, I, don't, I don't ask you to believe what I have or what I think. What we're here to dis determine and to learn from is what God thinks and what God has said. Okay? I just want to be an encouragement. Uh, uh, to encourage you to, to have a little talk with Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Romans 9. I'm going to read verses 1 through uh, 5. Okay? I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons, and the glory and the covenants of the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, think, he's saying, he, Paul is saying that he has great sorrow and unceasing grief. Think about it when Jesus wept, all right? Let me, let me read you this from the Gospel of Luke. This is 19th chapter of Luke, 41 through 44. When he, Jesus, approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Wow. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Mm. They didn't recognize God's fulfillment of his promise to send the Messiah. They didn't recognize that. So to understand any of this, uh, you have to understand one verse in particular. Peter wrote, 2 Peter 3.9, he said, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, mm -hmm. but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is the revelation of the Father's heart, His love. He doesn't desire that anybody perish, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the expression of God's love. The Apostle Paul not only had the mind of Christ, which is what he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we are supposed to have the mind of Christ, right? But he had the heart of God, because the love of God had been poured out within his heart through the Holy Spirit. Remember he wrote that earlier, yes. here in Romans, in chapter 5. The love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, that love is the love that says, I don't, I, I don't want to see anybody perish. Mm -hmm. Not anybody. The Apostle Paul, you know, he had this, this is his heart. Here in this letter, he expresses his sorrow and his grief over the lost among the Jewish people. 
You know, I've, I've said that the Sermon on the Mount is the teaching to the righteous. Yes. Everything else in the Bible is commentary. That's uh -huh. the foundation to Christianity. Well, but when Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, what, is, what does it mean to mourn? It means to have. You sorrow. know, you watch people sorrow. They have sorrow and grief mm -hmm. over the loss of somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what Paul is doing here. He's mourning mm -hmm. over the loss of those Jews who have not received Jesus Christ. I, I think we really, you know, if, if that's not our heart, we need to examine our hearts. <laughs> Maybe create me a clean heart, Lord, you know, yes, get a constantly. new heart. Every day, pray that. All right. In, in verse, you know, I said in, in verse 3 here, it said, For I could wish that I myself were cursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren. That's, that is the mind of Christ. That it most definitely is. For that indeed is exactly what, what Christ, Christ did. did. He separated himself from the Father for our sakes. What do you think it means in Matthew 27 when he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He took our place. Well, he took our place because only Jesus could. You see, That's Paul, Paul said he wishes he could, but he can't. He can't. Only Jesus could. For one moment in time, when Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for our sake, and that sin, the sin of the world, was nailed to that cross. He was separated from the Father, which is why he cried out in anguish. Why, you know, why have you forsaken me? God the Father had turned his face from Jesus Christ because he turned away from the sin of the world. Right? Answering, by the way, David's prayer in Psalm 51 where he said, that's exactly what he said, hide thy face from my sin. So Paul is actually saying that if he could, he would be, he would be willing to be separated from God. For the sake of others. For the others. sake of others. I, 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 don't, I don't know that I could pray that. I don't know that I could pray that. I mean, that, that, that's such an incredible, incredible statement about God's love at work in Paul. Amen. Now, you know, Paul said... And he wants us to be imitators. He, that's what yeah. I was just going to say. He, Paul said, be imitators of me, even as I am oh, Christ. of Christ. Mm. This be should be our heart. If it's God's heart and Christ's mind then it should be what is within us. That we should have this incredible longing to be used by God to touch the hearts of the lost. Mm. But it's like, you know, I mean, we, we put on little programs every once in a while and invite people to come to our church where we're having coffee and donuts or something. That's not a broken heart over the lost. No. It's, it's not. Um, I, I, I think... I, I just think that we need to ponder I was these just words. Say that. Those exact we, words I was going to say. <laughs> and maybe see if, mm. where is that love stirred up, up in us? Are, what price are we willing to pay to be used of God to touch the lost? You know, I, I go back and I've talked about this so many times, but it's worthy of talking about. I, I believe, you know, it says one plants and other waters, but it's God who gives the growth. Yes. That seed of the gospel, Peter says it's the imperishable seed of the word that's implanted in us that brings us to this new life. Mm -hmm. That seed was planted in Saul of Tarsus. Yes. On the day that Stephen stoned was stoned death. to death. Mm -hmm. And, and asked, pleaded, asked of the Father not to hold it against those who were doing this. Saul was among those hardly in agreement, yes, holding the coats of others so that they could more forcefully throw the stones at Stephen. He heard the love of God that day. Yes. He heard the love of God burst forth. When Stephen was stoned and that vessel was broken, the love of God Poor burst man. forth from Gosh. Stephen. Mm. And it touched Saul of Tarsus. And it bore fruit on that day on the road to Damascus when Paul encountered Jesus, the risen Savior. And, and was called, right? Mm -hmm. Paul was used so many times. He was willing to go to jail in, in Philippi so that a, a jailer would turn to him and say, what must I do to be saved? And Paul had the answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. So he had the answer, but he was willing to do that. He was, he was dying to flesh. <coughs> and, and that seems like such a difficult impossible thing to do but it's something that we have to do daily yes but he was able to do it I mean it, well, he is because 
Not because of his own strength, not because of his own power, not no. by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Because he allowed the spirit to have its way, his way, right. in his life. That's what it boils down to. So it's it just, can be done. But letting God do, surrendering to God and letting him have his way in our lives. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. All right. So anyhow, he's, he's, talking, he's talking about how the, the majority of Jews mm -hmm. in the majority. time of Jesus, and I'm going to tell you something. That hasn't changed. It's still the majority. Not, 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 only, not only did the majority not accept Jesus Christ, but then they would persecute and be that thorn in the flesh of Paul right. that he was bringing that word of the, the promised Messiah's arrival, right? But he goes on, look at verse 6, he says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, no. for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. While the stain and the curse of sins pass from father to child, yes. and they do, yes. it says that, I'm going to read you Exodus 34, verse 7, mm -hmm. talking about God who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Exodus 34, 7. You know, I've talked about this. I hear, I hear people in the church today talking about generational curses, and it, it stems from this and other verses like it, where it says that God will visit the sins of the father upon the children for generations. And they go around and they're going to pray prayers and break the curses. That's not the way it works. No. Uh, if, you, if you believe in generational curses, let me give you the answer. Change fathers. It's very simple. It's just, it is as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Change fathers. Because when you are born again, you are born of your father in heaven. And I promise you, he has no sin to pass on. Only righteousness. And righteousness only comes from our father in heaven through the atoning work of his son, Jesus Christ. It's not about your, your nation. It's not about being the children, uh, you know, it, it's about being the children of God, mm -hmm. not, not who you're the children of in the, in the natural, no, right? No. Just as Paul, now remember, Paul had said this only moments ago, right. back in the last chapter that we were studying in Romans chapter 8, he said, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So, what he's saying here is it's not about being an Israelite, it's about being a child of God, right. right? And you have to note that not, you know, we're talking about, he's saying that not all who are uh, Israelites fall into this category, right? That's what it says. That's what it says. But you have to know, not everybody calls himself a Christian. Or Christians. Are following Jesus Christ. Right. Are disciples right. of Jesus Christ. You know, um, it's easy to call yourself something. And it's easy to, you know, maybe you were baptized as a little infant by your parents. Mm -hmm. That doesn't do the trick. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you the truth. He said you will know them by their fruits. Yeah, it, 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 absolutely. It, it's like with those natural Israelites. It's still true today. It's about a real and personal relationship with the Lord. Right. And not about, it's not about church membership. It's not about family heritage. The only family member who can save you is the one that the Father anointed and appointed to be your big brother. And that's a fact. So, Paul goes on to explain in the next verse. I'm going to read 7 and 8. Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it's not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Not the flesh, okay, promise. but the promise. What promise? How about these? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. <coughs> That's a promise. That's a 
promise. You believe in him, you'll have eternal life. That's John 3, 14 and 15. Everybody knows 16, but you know. Mm -hmm. And then Paul, here in Romans, just a little way ahead of, I'm getting ahead of myself, he said, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him, Jesus, will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the promise. That's the promise. That's the promise. Okay, that's Romans 10, 11 and thir through 13. What we're talking about here is the sovereignty of Yahweh. The sovereignty of God. You understand the word sovereignty? Well, they do over here in England. Well, I don't know. I don't think they do either. No, they, they really don't. Okay. I understand what you're saying because here they have, quote unquote, they have a sovereign. They have the queen. The queen. But for all intents and purposes, she's become a figurehead. True. Yeah. Um, much like in, in a lot of Christianity. Yeah, true. we we recognize that yes, there's a king up there, but he's just kind of a figurehead. He doesn't affect mm -hmm. our everyday daily lives. So what we're seeing in the natural here, we're seeing in the spiritual realm, in That's much true. of the church, right? Yeah. So what I want to talk to sovereignty means absolute authority. Absolute mm -hmm. authority. Okay. Over every aspect of your life, right? Over everything, absolutely. So, I'm gonna, I just want to go ahead here and read down. Um, I'm going to read from verse 9 through verse 16, right? Okay. For this is the word of promise, At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For through the twins or though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there, no, there is no injustice with God, is there? No. May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on, the, on God who has mercy. Now, it's got to be noted here that uh, Paul, in the last chapter, had just written about the Lord's predestination of our eternal future mm -hmm. based on his foreknowledge. Of us, what we're going to right? Back in eight, in chapter eight, eight twenty nine, he said, "For those whom he foreknew, he predestined. he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son." So he he foreknew what choices we would make, what our what choices would be the ruling our lives, right. Right? right? So I mean, it's really important to get get a hold of that. Um, you, I don't want to get way off track here with Jacob and Esau, but you know, Esau sold his birthright. Yes, a bowl of porridge. Well. A lot of Christians sell their birthright pretty cheaply, too. That's right. When you start compromising with the world. But, well, that's not what we're talking about here. Okay. So, regardless of our approval or disapproval, or our liking or disliking of this revelation, it is indeed about the sovereignty of the Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, ruler over all of the kings of the earth. We're talking about God, the Ancient of Days. Hallelujah. The Word of God, what we're reading here, it's not, it's, this is not put forth or put out as a poll to see how we react to it, how we like it or dis dislike it, mm -hmm. but rather as a God-breathed, life-giving revelation for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Yes. That's what he wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16. Mm -hmm. All right? This isn't a poll. It's not about whether you like it or dislike it. That's the sovereignty of God. He doesn't need your approval. That's the way it is. Yeah, I mean, I've heard, and I'm going to get this wrong, I've heard people say, well, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. I know something. When God speaks it, it's settled. It doesn't need your approval. No. It doesn't need your belief. It doesn't need your participation. That. Once God it's spoke it, it's settled. It's done. It's settled in heaven, right? All right, let's go on to verse 17. I want to just zippy right along here. You are zippy. Yeah. For the scripture says to Pharaoh... For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, 
and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Right? Yes, when, he when Moses was bringing the people out. Mm -hmm. It was for God's purpose. Right? That my name, God's name, might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. It would be profitable here to look at a few verses uh, back in the book of De Daniel. Okay? It, if you turn to Daniel, I'm going to read from chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 and 21 says this. Daniel said, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to Him. It is He who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. You thought you were voting them in. Well, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. God removes kings and establishes kings. To King Nebuchadnezzar, ruler of Babylon, who attacked the people of God and the nation of God, the city of God, the Lord spoke through Daniel again to say, the God, this is, this is God speaking through Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar. He says, the God of heaven has given you the kingdom, the power. Yes. Now, I'm going to promise you, Nebuchadnezzar thought he had taken it by force, that he had taken it by his power, that he had taken it by his might. And Daniel, this young boy, stands in front of him and says, no, God, God gave, gave it, to it to you. Now, God gave it to him because he was a nice guy. Mm -hmm. God purpose. gave it to him to because he had a purpose. purpose in Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk to most Jews who are, are religious and have an understanding of their history, which should be all of them. And, and one of the great events, one of the horrific events in the history of the Jewish people is the Babylonian captivity. When Nebuchadnezzar came, came down with his mighty armies and conquered Israel, yes. conquered Judah, took, mm -hmm. took Jerusalem, and took the people captive back into Babylon. Well, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was the problem here. No, no, no. Nebuchadnezzar was not the problem. The Nebuchadnezzar was God's solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. Because the problem was that the people were rejecting God. Yes. Nebuchadnezzar was the cure. That's always the problem. It is always the problem. The problem, I'm going to tell you something. I hear, I, I, we are blessed to be able to do a lot of traveling, spend a lot of time with a lot of Christians in a lot of different settings. I minister to a lot of pastors. We, we visit with and spend time with a lot of pastors. And over and over and over, what I hear is if we could only vote the right person and if we could only get the right, listen, you can't fix mm -hmm. a spiritual problem with a political solution, a natural solution. Yeah. And the problem is spiritual. Yes, it is. It is a spiritual problem here in the United Kingdom. It's a spiritual problem in the United States of America. It is a spiritual problem in the world that we live in. And the only solution is a spiritual solution. And you want to know something? We're not going to get a nation to turn. Right now, what it is, is it's us as individuals to turn to the Lord and surrender to Him. All right, so I, that's, and that's what I have to say about that. Mm. Okay. Paul, can I, can I just interject? Something? Sure, you can. Of course, you can. I, I, you're I making like you. me. You're making me think about the spirit and the flesh, and it's a spiritual problem. Absolutely. God is spirit, so everything. And those who worship Him must worship, worship Him in spirit, spirit and truth. Yes. So everything about God is spirit. Adam and Eve, and she wasn't Eve before she <laughs> fell. Adam and the woman. They were spirit. Everything they did was spiritual until the sin. And then that brought in the flesh. Well, the, no, the, you're, you're almost right. Okay. Okay. They were the perfect meld. Of God's of, spirit. Because they were uh, in his image. They, because God had formed them from Adam from the dust of the earth. Right. Formed e, uh, the woman from an, a rib in him. Right. And while, until they sinned, they were that spirit alive in flesh uncorrupted okay okay it was sin that corrupted both their flesh and their spirit okay so there was flesh involved in that yes beginning. okay i thought maybe the flesh but, became flesh right well, no, well, well, it's it, it became over. no the, their flesh became corrupted because of the sin okay. because eve looked at the fruit of this tree and found it desirable with her eyes and believed the lie that the devil was telling and the two of them ate of the fruit and paid the price. And you know what? 
like that verse I read to you before, the sins of the father are passed on to the children. Not only did Adam and, and the woman pay the price, we still do. Yes, we do. Day by day by day. You know, we, we feel the, the, oh my goodness, do we feel the consequence of that sin. Um, and I, unfortunately, it seems as though the sin grows greater and greater and greater day by day. Which, by the way, is what Jesus said would happen as we go to those last days. What Paul said, you know, in, in when he wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and said, in the, in the last days, perilous times will come. Um, I mean, I, I just see, we were having this conversation the other day with a couple other folks and just talking about how the world has changed just in my lifetime, in analysis Amazing. lifetime. I don't know about your lifetime, but, uh, you know, there was a time when if, if a young lady got pregnant out of, out of, not married, out of wedlock, it was a shame. And it, it, she would typically be sent off to relatives in some distant part of the, the land, so um, not to bring that shame. We were in town center in, in <laughs> Oldham here in England yesterday, and I just happened to take note. Um, we, you know, we were in this little, we were in a place doing some business, and uh, there was a young lady there and the person across the counter, because they were talking about travel, um, said, is that Miss or Mrs? Because she was there with her little child. And the girl very proudly said, no, it's, it's, it's Miss. I, I got no ring on this finger. And after when she said that, it just it struck me. So we were in town for about an hour or so later, and I happened to notice because you'll, you'll find here how commonplace it is in it, going to any town center. Mm -hmm. And there are young, young girls. Mm -hmm walking around pushing prams with, with young, young, young children in them. So I just happened to pay attention yesterday, and I said, Alice, there. I saw nine young ladies pushing infants around, and not one had a wedding ring on. Not one of the nine had a wedding ring on. I mean, that would, that would have been inconceivable just when I was young. Not, that <clears throat> not that there wasn't sin when I was young, sure. yeah. but it is this increase. And the brazenness and of it, no shame. and then and the lack of shame about sin. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, okay. So anyhow. So the spirit and the flesh were there in the garden. Yes, they they, they were. Okay. It is the corruption of both that okay. has become the problem, and that's why when we get saved, Christ hasn't renewed our flesh. No. But He has renewed our spirit. our spirit. We we are born again, and we are given a new spirit. We died, and our life is hidden in Christ Jesus. You get a fresh start. That's right. I mean, if there's anybody out there watching this, mm. and you need a fresh start in life, there's only one way you're going to get it. It's not going to be making New Year's resolutions yeah. and deciding to get thinner, thinner or, or, or a better job or a nicer home. There's only one way for you to significantly impact your life, and that is to surrender it and give it up to Jesus Christ. Make Him Lord of your life. That's that's the only way to get new life and, and one that's right and good. Okay. All right. So anyhow, I was going to say, you know, we're talking about this authority thing. Yes. And Paul will say a little later on here in Romans in thirteen, it says every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, yes. for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Get that. I, I, I want to Say read this again. again. I, I want you to really listen to what, I, what Paul says. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. That's Romans 13.1. Now those words were written in the times... We're not exactly sure of what year Paul wrote this, but it was either in the reign of Claudius or Nero, <clears throat> and in the shadow of Caligula. I mean, this was not written in times when they had Far. great Christian leaders. Trust me on that. I mean, you know, not these by... Were demonic. Not, well, these were harsh, harsh people. Yeah. And yet Paul is saying we've got to be in subjection to these people because their authority comes from God. Now, if you don't think that's true, think about the words of Jesus Christ right out of his mouth, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Because when he was on trial for his life, mm -hmm. <coughs> on trial for his life before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate was the representative of the Caesar. He represented all of the power of Rome. And he's standing there, and Pilate says to Jesus, 
You do not speak to me? Mm. You don't, do you not know that I have authority to release you? And I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no authority. You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Pontius Pilate. Jesus said, yeah, you have authority. But it doesn't come from the, from the, from the throne in Rome. It comes from the throne in heaven. All authority comes from God. Well, you can say that's right, but the simple the fact of the matter is, I, I don't know who believes that. Few. Whoever is in power, whoever has authority, it is about the purpose of God. God is in control. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be perfectly honest. At the time we're doing this Bible study, Barack Obama is the President of, of the United States. And interestingly enough, because we do a lot of traveling, I would say, you know, half the churches we went to, they were, they were way politically biased in favor of Obama, and half the churches we went to, they were so against. biased against Obama. And, and the fact of the matter is, <coughs> Obama is, at this present time, the President of the United States for one reason. God put him there. God put him there. And God put him there because he has a purpose for it. Yes. You want to know something? I don't, I don't know exactly what that purpose is. Mm -hmm. I got some theories, by the way, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. What I am certain of, what I am sure of, is that he is in power because it suited God's purpose. God put him there. Okay? And there, there is one I remembered that you said you didn't think anybody was anybody believing that authority or understood that authority, but there was one, the centurion. The centurion. We Alice, know of. <laughs> yeah, Alice, well, as Alice mentioned, people just don't understand authority real well. No. Because it is, you want to talk about something that is opposed in the flesh. Mm, because authority means we're talking about who has charge over you, right? It's who you have to submit And pride to. says nobody has charge over me. I'm in charge of my own life. The centurion came to Jesus. And you know the story in the gospel, it just talks about how he said, you know, my son is sick and... Jesus said, I'll, I'll go to your house. And the centurion said, I'm not worthy for you to go to my house. But only say the word. And my servant shall be healed. And he'll be healed. And he said, I understand this because I'm a man under authority. Mm -hmm. He's a Roman centurion. He's under authority. Yes. You better believe he is. Yes. And he says, I'm a man in authority. When I tell somebody to do something, they do it because I have authority over them. And he said, I recognize, you know, what he's saying is, I recognize that authority in you, Jesus. Exactly. And Jesus said, I haven't found such great faith anywhere in all of Israel. If you don't think there's a connection between faith and authority, better get, go read those chapters or those passages about th that centurion. They are absolutely and intimately linked. Because until you understand the authority of God, you will never understand that nothing is impossible with God. Because everything is subject to God. Amen. Okay? That's exciting. It should be. And, and just by the way, let me just make this statement. Some of you may want to close your ears. God is not a proponent of democracy, as many think. Nor is he in favor of communism or socialism or any other man-made system you can think of. He's a theocrat. That's right. He's a king. That's right. All right, we're going to talk about that a bit more here. Let's move along. Romans 9, 18 to 23 is what I'm going to read right now. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? Mm -hmm. On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Yeah. Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for, for common use? Yes. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory? The prophet Isaiah said this, 
Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker. Yes. An earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Or the thing which you are making say, he has no hands? Isaiah 45, 9. If you don't like this whole idea about authority, please take a look right now at your dashboard and see that little red light's blinking. That's your, right? No, that's your pride warning, yes. They have one for the oil, they have one for the brakes, they have one. They should have a pride warning. Yeah. So when you get this, boy, that little thing starts blinking at you. Yeah. Because it is pride that keeps us from accepting authority in our lives. Yes. He is Lord. Okay? Yes, He is. When all is said and done, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. when it's all over, mm -hmm. at the name of Jesus, Every knee will bow mm. of those who are in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2, mm. verses 10 and 11. Every knee shall bow. Every. All of the people that stood and mocked God, every knee, Adolf Hitler is going to bow and cry out, Jesus is Lord. Joseph Stalin, Nero, Caligula, I mean, every, every one, Nebuchadnezzar, will bow down, put their knee on the ground, and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Democracy has drilled us with one great big lie. Now, I know, listen, I know a lot of you are just not going to like what I have to say right now. It's office at BibleTalk.com. You should write Jesus at heaven.org or you whatever it is. Because, it him you know, first. I, this, this is really, if you think it's for me, then, then check, all right? Check with him first. All authority comes from God. Yes. That's what Jesus said, quite clearly. The Continental Congress of the United States of America on July 14th, uh, 4th, 1776. In a Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson said this, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. It's backwards. The Upside Universal down. Declaration of Human Rights. Mm. An equivalent to this that was written by the United Nations in December of 1948. Article 21 of this Universal Declaration of Human Rights that virtually every nation agreed to and signed at the United Nations says this, The will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. The 13 colonies that form the United States of America and the United Nations hold this very important and very incorrect belief in common. They both believe that authority flows from the bottom up. Not. Mm -mm. Now you got to examine yourself. Paul says, "Let a man examine himself." What do you believe? Do you do you believe that God has? I mean, the word of the people, the people, the people put the the people in power. Listen, God puts them in power. Yes, He does. Uh, you know, you can debate with me all day long about the mechanism of that, but I'm telling you that the people are in authority. Good, bad, or indifferent. The Caligulas of the world, the Neros of the world, the Obamas, the Queens, the, 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 all those people are in office because it suits God's purpose. Amen. I'm going to go someplace that I don't know that I really want to go. How many of you Bible-believing, Spirit-filled, Lord-loving Christians out there can say with me, even so come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes. yes. Hallelujah. Come Lord Jesus. And mean it. Because you see, when the Spirit and the Bride say come, He's going to come. That's right? right. Well, here. But the fact of the matter is, if your desire, your great desire, is for the return of the Lord, you have to understand the consequence of that prayer. Right. Because before He comes, the Bible says, God says, His Word says, there's going to be terror. Uh, mm. I mean, read Matthew 24. Abomination and Read, read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Read the passages in the Bible 
Read the Gospels where it says that, that violence, lawlessness will increase. Men's love will grow cold. I mean, read these things. That's what's happening out there in the world. That has to pro precede, that has to precede his, his coming. So if we're praying for his coming, we have to understand that those things, we're calling for those things to happen now. All of that will increase. <clears throat> so on the one hand, I hear Christians praying, they want everything smooth, happy, and peachy cream here on earth now, and then say, Jesus, come. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It's not going to work that way. But we need to be praying, even so, come Lord Jesus. <coughs> I'm going to get a new body. Hallelujah. One that doesn't have a cough at the moment. And it's, if it rains, it's going to be the rain of the glory of God and the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. That latter rain. All right. Authority does not flow from the bottom up. Authority flows from the top down. It is imperative that you understand, and don't just, do not, I'm not going to let this go. Do not just fluff it off, slough it off, that the Constitution of the United States says that authority flows from the bottom up. I'm not going to let just let it slide by that this, this Declaration of Human Rights from the United Nations says the same thing. Authority flows from the bottom up. That's a lie from the pits of hell. That's what Satan wants you to believe. Mm -hmm. He wants you to believe that we have the power. Do not. Do we not. have the power. But I'm going to tell you, go read that prayer that Jesus said, said should be the model for our prayer. Yes. For thine is the kingdom, the glory, the power. For God's God. got the power. Not you, not me. Any power that we have is Him working in us and through us. It is not us. It is Christ within us. It is not us. That's right. And if okay. we knew that and realized that, it there would change be no us. pride. Yes. Well, there would be no pride. But you know what? Um, we Christians need to know that. Because I'm, I, I'm going to say this again. Until you come to an understanding of that. Not a revelation. You don't need a revelation. God has revealed this. Yes, it is very clear in His Word. He doesn't need to reveal it. He's given it to us already. You need an understanding of it and what it means. It means that He is in complete control. As long as you're not in rebellion. If you're in rebellion, God's going to take you and put you in a place where you're no longer in rebellion. Yeah. That place where you are no longer in rebellion may be past the end of your life. Mm. Where your knee bows and you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I want to do that today. I want to do that now. And when I say that Jesus Christ is Lord, I'm telling you that He is the Lord of my life. But He is also the Lord of my finances. He is the Lord of my health. He is the Lord of my relationship with Alice. He is the Lord of everything in my life. Amen. He is in control. Nothing happens in my life that God does not have control over and He doesn't have a purpose for. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I'll probably end around here. Maybe I will. It's just, you know, any of you who know me know the story that I was hit by a speeding truck in, in Central America. This is, now it's going back quite a while. It was in 1989. Alice and I were living there as missionaries. And I had stopped alongside a road to help somebody in, in an evening on one of these jungle roads. And a speeding semi came along and, and hit me. I was on foot. It hit me, then I hit our vehicle that Alice was in, demolished that. The fellows that hit me were, were killed on the spot there. People said afterwards to me, I wonder why this happened, I wonder why this happened. And, and then I hear other people talking, and I can hear them, you know, you know was it because he sinned? Or his parents, you know? It's like, it was because God had a purpose. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. That accident, I, I'm, I'm loath to use the word accident. accident. Yeah. That, event that event has proven to be such an incredible blessing in my life. Amen. When we, as we, from the, from the night that I was hit, God used that. People were saved. People were encouraged. People were blessed. And through today, all these years later, people read, now there's a book, you know, about it, The Master's Call. People are blessed and encouraged. Not by my faith, no, but, but by God's, God's response. Yes. God's faithfulness throughout that. When I came up to the States, went to a, a hospital here, um, how many lives were touched there? It was incredible. We went back down to Belize. I was treated in ways you would not believe down there because nobody believed that we would show up again. Right. Most of the people down there thought that I had died. Right. It opened so many doors. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, I would not, had God give me a choice and said, okay, 
You know, I think I have a great idea. Why don't you go out and get hit by a truck tonight? Oh, I don't know how to handle no, no, that. No, 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 no. So he didn't bother <laughs> asking. Yeah, let's do it another way. He didn't bother asking. No, he didn't. So this is the way it's going to be. I'm, you know, the, the, I would not, for a zillion teen dollars, have that event come out of my life if I had the potential to do that. I wouldn't want to make a habit out of it. No. But if that's what God chose, to use this event in my life to touch so many other lives, that's absolutely perfect and fine with me. Amen. And I don't need to sit around and analyze it and say, why did this happen? It happened. No. You wonder? God was in control. And I was certain of that even that night that as I lay there in the road or on the side of the road in the, in the bush, as I lay there broken and bashed, praising and thanking, praising him. And thanking him, I knew at that moment he was in that he was in total control Absolutely. of that situation. There was no doubt, no doubt whatsoever. You know why? Because he is Lord. Amen. <laughs> because he's Lord. He is Lord. Mm. He wasn't, you know, it says his ear is not dull, his arm is not short, he wasn't asleep. When Elijah went up on Mount Carmel with the false prophets, and they, you know, and they danced around and tried to get God, their God, to call a fire down on their offering, and he couldn't do it. Couldn't Elijah do it. said, "You know, what's the matter? Is he on vacation? Is he on holiday? Is he off asleep?" He stepped out of the office. My God is not on vacation. My God is not asleep. My God is not on holiday. My God is not away. No. His ear is not dull. His arm is not short. Hallelujah. He's in control. That night that I was hit by the truck, it wasn't because he had turned his back and was looking at something else. He was orchestrating. I can live with that because He is the authority in my life. Amen. He chooses. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Now, I'm just going to read Romans 9, 24 through 26. And I, I, think, I don't think we'll have time to really get into this the way I want. But. So anyhow, he was talking about you know, how God shows mercy. And he says, even us, whom He also called. Now... Remember, he's writing to the Romans. He's writing to the Gentiles, right? He also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people. And her who is not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. I, I have had opportunity, I, when we were up in New York for years, I had a lot of opportunity to minister to and, and talk with Jewish people. And through the years, I've had that same opportunity. Um, and I know one of the things that concerns a lot of Jews that don't, don't understand, even as a matter of fact, on our way over here, I, had, I got to spend uh, the better part of two weeks with a, with a fellow, a Jewish fellow, and you know, got to share with him. He was asking me about, you know, what is this thing with the mess Messianic Jews? And uh, the, the fact of the matter is, the Jews were chosen of God. And by the way, his gifts and his calling are irrevocable. Right. Irrepentable, right? So that calling is still on them, as we will see as we get into the, finish up in the ninth and the 10th and the 11th chapter of, of this letter to the Romans. But they don't understand a lot of times, you know, well, it's because of pride, mm. you know, that we're the people of God. Yes. yes, absolutely, without doubt. Salvation comes from the Jews, and that's what Paul says in this letter. Mm. But the fact is, they were to be witnesses to spread His glory, proclaim His glory throughout the world so that others might be drawn in. It wasn't exclusive, and it's, it's not exclusive to us. No. And you know what? God will call in people you don't even like. God people, will save people yeah. you don't like in the least. People who you call your enemy. Yeah, you better get over it. Not only should you get over it, you better be praying for them that they do get saved Amen. and come to be your brother, your sister. Hallelujah. Part of the same family. That's right. Because that's what Jesus said. He said, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who hate you. Love those. Bless them. That's a good place to end this study. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for your enemies. Pray. Show that you have that same heart that mm. Paul had that he received from God when God took that heart of stone and put it in a heart of flesh. Mm. That your desire and my desire is the same as God's desire mm. that none should perish but all come to everlasting life. Thank you. So Father, we do. We thank you mm. that you made a way 
for all to come to everlasting life. That you sent your Son into this world, and he who knew no sin became sin for our sake. That we might become part of that family, the family of God. That we would become your sons and your daughters, Lord God. That he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. We thank you that you made a way, and his way's name is Jesus Christ. The way, the truth, and the life. Father, change our hearts, cleanse our hearts, create in us hearts, Lord God, that long to be used by you to touch other lives so that they might come into the fullness of life in you. And Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit indwelling us, that you gave us, help us to submit to your authority in our lives, to surrender our lives totally and completely and absolutely to your authority that we might know the fullness of joy and that you might be glorified in our lives. We just praise you and we thank you and we bless your most holy name. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, it was just a blessing to be with you again and we look forward to you being back next time. And until then, Jesus loves you. A lot. <laughs>